Hey there YouTubers, this is Kevin from The Bat Productions, and today I have a, a very exciting new addition to our series that is world famous, everyone in the world knows about this of course at this point, it's the Game of Thrones What If series. And today, we have a scenario that I think many people have kicked around in their minds at one point or another. This is going to be strictly show based, I may add in a little information from the books just to give context to certain things that I end up deciding in this What If scenario. What if Robert Baratheon and Cersei Lannister actually had a child, the beautiful black-haired baby. Basically, what if that child had survived and we had a true-born heir, a Baratheon and a Lannister, sitting on the Iron Throne, potentially as the prince-in-waiting? What would have happened in the story? What would have changed in the scenario? Now, before I dive into all of it, I have a lot here. This is probably going to be a very long video. I just want to let you know this was actually a really tough video for me to write. There definitely are changes based off of this. However, some of it is kind of a choose your own adventure. And this is the pathway that I felt was most likely to happen moving forward in the, in the show story. So if you feel differently, that's fine. We'll talk about it in the comments down below. However, I think this is how it would go and how it would lay out. So we'll try to start off with some basic things. Obviously, since it is their kid, he's going to be raised like a prince. So he's going to be raised kind of similar to Joffrey, but I think it's going to be a little bit different where Robert Baratheon, I think he's going to care a little bit more. And the reason why I think he's going to care a little bit more about this child than Robert in the canon storyline did, not because he's a Baratheon. I don't even know if he knew what Joffrey's hair color was. I think he was that drunk all the time. The only reason why I think there's a chance is because this kid was conceived roughly around the same time that Cersei and Robert got married. So, you know, nine months, ten months later, something like that. I think there was more of a fighting chance chance for not only Robert and Cersei's relationship, which would have only gotten a little bit better. Robert still was not going to love Cersei. However, I think there's a chance that he would have paid more attention to this child before he really got into drunken stupor land that he did with Joffrey that only took place about two years later. So there was a very fine window for us to operate in, but I think in that fine window, Robert possibly would have been a better father, and maybe he wouldn't have ended up as such a mama's boy jerk that Joffrey ended up as. So I think this child, who I'm going to name Oris Baratheon because I love that Baratheon name, I think he would have been a little bit better of an attitude, not a psychopath. But just to be clear, Joffrey still happens, Tommen still happens, and Marcella still happens. I mean, Cersei and Jaime are still banging like a couple of cymbals in an overworked marching band. That never stops in this scenario. However, I think the way that Oris Baratheon is treated by Robert is a little bit better, which means that potentially if he were to take the Iron Throne, which we'll see in a second, I think that actually will end up being a more even-keeled person. And speaking of things that don't really change between Cersei and Robert, there's no doubt that Cersei in the end is going to want to kill Robert Baratheon. Again, the relationship is better than what happens in the canon storyline on the TV show, but it's still not good. They're still definitely going to be wanting her to kill him. So even though we have a little bit of a different scenario, Robert's going to have to die. That's just going to be the way it is. Oris is going to be a little bit of a mama's boy, so she's going to be totally content with just taking over that role of being the single mother. I will say from here, this is really where the journey kind of goes out, but this is where I think things get a little sticky. We go to Ned Stark as Hand of the King. We're just going to jump right ahead because I was thinking in this scenario, maybe Jon Arryn, who was the Hand of the King before Ned Stark, alongside Robert Baratheon, I thought maybe, maybe this guy would be alive. Remember that Jon Arryn is the guy that was poisoned and is the one who basically made the position of Hand of the King vacant. Now, there are multiple reasons why he ended up being killed, but one of them is because he seemingly knew that the heirs to the Iron Throne of Robert Baratheon were not legitimate. And Littlefinger obviously couldn't let that happen, so Jon Arryn had to die. Because if Jon Arryn knows that there is a black-haired Baratheon in Oris waiting for the throne, even if he had some suspicion that the other three were in fact pure Lannisters, maybe he wouldn't go quite as hard. However, aside from that, that's only one of the reasons why Littlefinger needed Jon Arryn dead. In my opinion, I think that Jon Arryn would die anyway at a slightly different point in time, maybe later on, because I don't think Jon Arryn would do as much research with Stannis Baratheon and figure out the plot for Littlefinger to go like, all right, well, we need you dead. Yes, Littlefinger is going to eventually need Jon Arryn to die because eventually he wants to take over the Vale of Arryn. He wants to have total control of that and he needs to get Jon Arryn out of there in order to do it. But more importantly, this is where a context from the books comes in. Robert Arryn was actually supposed to be fostered by Stannis Baratheon on Dragonstone. But if Jon Arryn, who was going to send him away, is killed, then that means that Liza Arryn doesn't have to send her son anywhere, and we all know how grossly in love she is with her son. So by poisoning Jon Arryn and killing him, guess who gets to make the decision? 
Liza. So eventually John Aaron's gonna have to die no matter what, but I thought maybe in this scenario he'd get to live. Unfortunately, not the case. Robert Baratheon is still gonna have to go north, still gonna have to get a hand of the king in Ned Stark and bring him down to King's Landing, although I believe it would be at a later date. Now kind of parlaying off the fact that John Aaron found out that Joffrey, Marcella, and of course Tommen are not true heirs to the Iron Throne. I think in this scenario when you think about Ned, who also found out that they were not heirs to the Iron Throne, Ned Stark, again, kind of like John Aaron, knowing that Oris Baratheon is a true heir, I'm not sure that he would go out of his way to upset Robert Baratheon if he knows that a true heir is going to be on the Iron Throne. He has no reason to advocate for Stannis Baratheon to take the throne because Stannis would only be second in line and not first. So I think even if Ned did go on the hunt to try to figure out if Robert's children really weren't his children, the fact that Oris Baratheon would be trueborn and he would know it based off of the histories of the big era and the small houses of Westeros, I don't think he would do too much about it. He probably wouldn't tell Robert. He certainly wouldn't confront Cersei Lannister about it once Robert's dead, creating a tenuous situation between him and the Lannisters. So I think honestly, he would just kind of pooter along being Hand of the King, because I'm sure Robert Baratheon upon his death would ask Ned Stark to become not necessarily a protector of the realm, but he would be a guide for Oris to make sure that he stays in the straight and narrow. So basically what I'm saying is I don't think there'd be massive conflict between Ned and Cersei, which is a big deal because obviously that's really what led to Ned being killed. And also I don't think Oris Baratheon would be cruel like Joffrey Baratheon, so even if he ended up taking the throne and Ned had some kind of problem, I don't think Oris would say, off with his head, Elin Payne, and instead he would get sent to the wall. But in this scenario, I'm not proposing any of that stuff happens. I think Ned is loyal for the time being and uh, he kind of brushes over if there were some twin cess children. I think that Cersei spies will know that Ned will be doing research and I think Ned will do research because we have characters like Varys, for example, who keeps putting these books in front of Ned going like, hey, I wonder why Jon Arryn died. By the way, here's a book that completely confirms whether or not Baratheons and Lannisters have blonde children, which they don't, spoiler alert. So I think that he'll still be doing research, but as long as he's not actively doing anything wrong, I think that even the idiot that Cersei is wouldn't dare kind of impose on Ned unless it was life or death. And if Ned is content as pie to not threaten anyone with anything or expose the Lannisters, I don't think anything's going to happen to him. I mean, the North is not a section of the country that you really want to pick a fight with, and I don't think she would if she doesn't have to. And I actually want to clean up a, one or two details here. Just to be clear, with Robert Baratheon going to ask Ned Stark to become Hand of the King, obviously that means that he's going to ask for a joining of the houses. In the TV show, it was Joffrey and Sansa. In this scenario, it'd be Oris and Sansa. It'd be exactly the same thing. The prince-in-waiting is going to marry Sansa Stark. And that would go down this way as well, so that means that Sansa would be at King's Landing and Arya would likely be at King's Landing in this whole deal. Actually, this part is where I have kind of a big divergence from the TV show. Because Jon Arryn dies later than he normally does, and that means that the royal party goes up to the north at a different time, I basically think that a perfect storm of things happened in episode one that would not be repeated in this scenario. The big thing that I'm referring to is Bran climbing on the tower at Winterfell, eventually seeing Jaime and Cersei banging. And because that happened, a lot of things came off. In this scenario, because it's different and I don't think you're going to get the same result nine times out of ten, I think that Bran does not catch Jamie and Cersei banging, which obviously means he doesn't get tossed out the window, which means that he does not get paralyzed, which means that he also does not have an assassin come after him to kill him, which means that Tyrion is not captured on the road back from the north by Catelyn Stark, which means that a lot of things between the Starks and the Lannisters do not pop off, including Jamie Lannister attacking Ned Stark in the street and Tywin Lannister mobilizing the Lannister army to get Tyrion back. So I think that a lot of the tension between the Lannisters and the Starks are basically wiped away if Bran does not catch Jaime and Cersei having sex like that. As far as him being able to walk and stuff, I don't think that really matters for Bran in the end. Honestly, him not having his legs anymore is pretty useless in the whole story, so who cares? But I think that this part is overarchingly huge. I mean, just one thing, like instantly, boom. Bronn is completely gone from the story if this happens. There's no reason for Bronn to exist if they don't capture Tyrion at the end. And poor Sir again maybe gets to live a few more years. And Bronn being absent ends up affecting a lot of different things, which I'm not going to go terribly far down the rabbit hole, but even someone like the Hound may not exist because Bronn bailed him out at the Battle of Blackwater Bay. Certainly he wouldn't end up as Lord's High Garden, but I think a lot of people would probably be happy about that. So quick summary as I get to the end of this little section of the What If video of what I've said. John Aaron, Robert Baratheon all still die, but at slightly different times. Ned Stark does not die, and he doesn't attempt to give the throne to Stannis. I think Oris Baratheon, who will have been paid more attention to by Robert Baratheon, wouldn't really have a reason to behead Ned Stark in any way when he becomes king after Robert's death. 
and his family doesn't try to capture any Lannisters, so the relationship between the Lannisters and the Starks are still okay. But that's what I have so far, but don't get me wrong, Littlefinger is going to do what he can to ruin this. The whole reason why the Starks and the Lannisters came to each other's throats, really, was concocted by Littlefinger, because Littlefinger needs instability at King's Landing in order to eventually get his plan of getting the Vale and taking over everything into motion. So even though it didn't work out this way, Littlefinger is going to be constantly working behind the scenes in order to make sure that the Starks and Lannisters do fight. And that's where we get to a little bit later on. Also, I forgot to mention this. Jaime doesn't get captured. That means he keeps his right hand. He's still a top member of the Kingsguard at King's Landing around the Iron Throne. That also means that Ser Barristan likely keeps his position. And that's because I think Joffrey was most likely the catalyst behind letting go of Barristan Selmy rather than Cersei Lannister herself. So even though a Bors still would have killed Robert Baratheon potentially, I think that Barristan is unfortunately going to stay at King's Landing with the evil people, which obviously has huge ramifications for dear Daenerys Targaryen, which we'll touch on in a little bit. But I just at least want to wrap up what King's Landing looked like right now up to this point. Now we're going to move forward with Littlefinger and how it gets a little more chaotic. So the way I can kind of see this working out in a really easy way, it's really just transferring what happened with Bran up in the north and bringing it down to King's Landing. I think Littlefinger needs Ned Stark to be removed one way or another. In order for him to do this, it gets rid of, obviously, a love rival in Ned Stark, but also, that's the perfect way to ignite a war between the Starks and the Lannisters. So I think potentially he uses the Cat's Paw assassin and kills Ned Stark, maybe in the middle of the night, who knows, and ends up blaming someone like Tyrion Lannister for it, because that dagger did belong to Tyrion. Easy to plan on a character that people just don't care that much about other than Jaime. So I think that Ned Stark would be murdered in the night, and he would end up planting that and assuming that it would be poor Tyrion. And I think everyone would be ready to get on board with that. Like he needs this to happen because if he lets it just stick around where Oris and Sansa get married and everyone's all happy, you're going to have this Baratheon, Stark, Tully, Aaron, Lannister alliance that people just like, there's no way that he's going to be able to eventually get the fairy tale ending that he wants for himself if they're all happy. So he's got to make sure that he causes chaos and he does it efficiently. With Ned Stark dead, I think that the dagger's found by the Kingsguard, Tyrion is brought to the Black Cells, Jaime obviously protests, and he fights for Tyrion in this whole deal. I mean, it's a losing fight, but he fights for him. Cersei tries to give her own wisdom and counsel. I think she's gonna be cool with Tyrion being in prison. And meanwhile, Tywin Lannister is called from the Casterly Rock, not only so he can come on behalf of his son, but also because he's gonna be named the new Hand of the King. Now, the Starks are gonna demand justice, of course, and it makes sense that they would do that. However, with the Tyrion trial, I think that it's going to end, unfortunately, where Tyrion is convicted of killing Ned Stark. Now, I would say he would demand a trial by combat, but realistically, that's not something he's going to be able to do. If he were to do that, he would name his brother Jaime, who's a Kingsguard, and he'd be fighting the crown, which he can't accept. It cannot happen. So unfortunately, Tyrion would know that's not a choice. But I also think that Tywin Lannister, although he's not a huge fan of Tyrion, and whomever else is overseeing it, probably like an Aris cersei kind of combination, so they would want him sent to the Wall. Tyrion Lannister would be sent there, and would have to travel past Winterfell. I don't think the Starks would assassinate him, or anything like that. I think he would just happen to go up to the wall, and obviously he'd be a part of that storyline moving forward. Now, the Starks aren't exactly happy about this, of course. I mean, they lost their father, and they lost their liege lord up in the north, so they're going to be a little bit pissed. However, I think they would accept the results. They would consider it justice, at least under the king's law. But they would demand that they would get Sansa and Arya Stark back. Because Arya and Sansa would be down there, but when Ned Stark is killed, there's really no reason for them to be around other than Sansa being married to Oris, which the Starks are going to consider withdrawing. However, I like to think of Oris Baratheon as more of a noble person. Robert Baratheon was always great at making partnerships with people that he didn't exactly get along with the best. He would find a way to make it work. And I want to say that he, even in his drunken stupor, would be able to teach that a little bit to a 14-year-old Oris Baratheon. So I would think that he would show a little bit of wisdom and he says, listen, Starks, you can have Sansa back. However, I'm coming with her. And in the hopes that he could go north 
talk to Rob Stark and Catelyn and be able to make his pitch and say, I think that the realm is going to be stronger with a Baratheon on the Iron Throne and a Stark along with him. So I think that they would ask that the marriage continue on and ultimately the Starks end up saying, okay, let's do it. So Tyrion being sent to the wall and Santa Stark continuing with the marriage, I think is enough to stave off war during this time period. The Starks keep Arya up at Winterfell though, which probably changes her timeline quite a bit. I think that maybe she goes out and does some adventures and everything, but I don't think she goes to Bravos and becomes a faceless person or becomes a badass fighter. Like she's a badass, I'm sure, but I don't think she does all that stuff. So Arya's timeline changes quite a bit. She's obviously not as big an adventure as we kind of expected her to be. And Sansa Stark is gonna be married to the king, which is great. Unfortunately, before we get to that rosy ending, I think on the road back to King's Landing, unfortunately, Oris Baratheon is going to fall ill and he's going to die. Again, a calculated move by Littlefinger. I think that he knows this is getting too stable. So while they're around the area of the Vale, roughly, I believe that Oris Baratheon, whether it's through poisoning, whether it's through being stabbed, murder, whatever it is, I think secretly Oris Baratheon is gonna meet an ill fate once again, because obviously it's gotta be on the low low if Littlefinger is gonna make this look like it was someone else's fault. So he's going to end up killing Oris Baratheon and he's going to frame Sansa Stark. And what he needs to do is he's going to get Liza to have the Knights of the Vale capture Sansa Stark, bring her there, which I know is a little bit of a conflict because that is her niece. But unfortunately, Liza Aaron will do anything that Littlefinger says. Littlefinger is going to tell the Lannisters, oh, those animals, I will talk to my dear old love Liza and be able to capture her. And then he's going to tell the Starks, oh, the Lannisters made me do it blah, 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 blah. that's I don't know if that was a little finger or an Oberyn Martell accent but I'll I'll get better at it so little finger is gonna volunteer his services for both sides and make them feel better meanwhile he's just raising tensions between the Starks and the Lannisters exactly how he needs it to and making himself look really good to both parties the Starks are pissed and want Sansa Stark back however the Lannisters and the Baratheons are kind of annoyed and they want justice for the king obviously so they're gonna have the army of the Vale march Sansa Stark back to King's Landing, or at least a small contingent. Now, the Northern Army is going to try and head it off, but unfortunately, it's not going to be enough. They're not going to be able to catch Sansa Stark's march back to King's Landing, so they're going to be kind of SOL, the Starks. Oh yeah, minor note. That means Joffrey is king now. With Oris Baratheon dying, that means they have turnover really quickly, and we have Joffrey. Now, to be clear, I don't think it's the same Joffrey that we saw on the television show. Because he is not the heir apparent, and he instead, he was second in line, I think that Joffrey is a more humble guy, maybe not as entitled as he once was. Mind you, he's still gonna be a little bit kooky, but not exactly as he was in the TV show. So I think he'll be more even keeled. I dare say he'll probably even be closer to Tommen in temperament, because he'll be the second son, not the first son, would be the second son. So I think there's a possibility that he's gonna be a little bit better than he was. Mind you, I think it's mainly just because of his grooming growing up. Cersei babied Joffrey in the TV show, and I think that here, Cersei's more likely to baby Oris a little bit more. It's a little bit different. Flap of the butterfly's wings. This is what I assume would occur. And he'd have the excellent guidance of Tywin Lannister around almost the whole tenure of his rule, so I think that things would be a little bit more stable and okay. And a commentary on Tyrion's time at the Wall, I think that he would just be like another guy at the Wall. Obviously he's smart, but physically he's gonna be challenged up in that environment where it's very masculine driven and everything like that. I think he'd become really good friends with Jon Snow. Obviously he did in the TV show, the canon. It's, it's said that they were good friends, they liked each other and enjoyed their company. Um, however, I think it's actually not that unrealistic that he would possibly die in one of these conflicts between the Wildlings or the White Walkers and the Night's Watch. But of course that affects like Daenerys' storyline and Jorah and stuff like that. So uh, quite a bit different. Anyway, obviously Sansa has to be put on trial. That's, it's important. I mean, obviously if she's gonna be framed for killing Oris Baratheon, the king of the Seven Kingdoms, she has to be put on trial. And because she's gonna do this, she's gonna get a little bit of a whisper from a little friend nearby, which I think is gonna be Littlefinger visiting her in the Black Cell. I think he's gonna go down there and say, hey, don't you know the trial by combat is one of the most popular ways of defending yourself in the Seven Kingdoms and the ancient ways? And I think that Sansa Stark is going to basically pick up on that as the naive little girl that she is. Actually, it's probably her best way of survival. And she's gonna say, I demand a trial by combat. And her choice is gonna be none other than her brother, Robert Stark. 
Rob with two Bs is going to come to King's Landing to the Red Keep and he is going to face off on behalf of Sansa Stark and try to get the sister back. And who is his opponent going to be? Now thankfully the Kingsguard has a few great options, Jaime Lannister being the most obvious one. However, I don't think he'll be chosen for a couple reasons. I don't think they would want to endanger Jaime Lannister no matter how good he is. It's still not a good idea in order to put one of the members of the house right up there. Cersei wouldn't be down for it, Tywin wouldn't be down for it. So I think the obvious choice after that is going to be Sir Barristan Selmy. If they have any kind of thoughts about Barristan being too old, it makes sense to use him. They know he's really good, but if he does die, probably not the worst thing in the world. Jaime gets to be Lord Commander, and then the Stark stuff can kind of go away. But just to be clear, I think they definitely want justice. Cersei is going to want Sansa Stark to be killed. But I think Barristan will be chosen, so we have Rob Stark versus Barristan Selmy fighting for the honor of the King's Guard. And of course, whether or not Sansa should be killed, but that's secondary, of course. Briefly, the way I think the fight goes, I think they start off feeling evenly matched. Obviously, Barristan Selmy is an old man. He's, uh, you know, he's lost a step or two. Back in his day, he was arguably the greatest sword fighter in all the Seven Kingdoms. And Robb Stark is a boy, pretty much. He's only about like 16 years old or so, but he's a good warrior. I think they end up going back and forth a little bit for a minute and a half, two minutes maybe, Barristan feeling it out, learning Robb Stark's moves. Robb can be a little impetuous, but generally a fairly skilled fighter. Thank you so much, Roger Cassell, for teaching him. However, not long after, maybe two to three minutes, I think poor Rob Stark, the young wolf, is going to get slashed and killed. Meaning that Rob Stark dies, Barristan Selmy wins one, ten points to Gryffindor! And unfortunately, Sansa Stark is going to get her head taken by Sir Illyn Payne, and the Starks can't really do a damn thing about it. Even though I think the Stark army would be outside of King's Landing, unfortunately they wouldn't be able to do too, too much as it is fairly fortified. However, the Starks don't have to sit there and take it for the rest of this time. That research that we had talked about before that Jon Arryn and Ned Stark had done about the King's illegitimate children, I think this this is when it bubbles up to the surface. Even though Ned Stark and Jon Arryn didn't come forward about it, Stannis Baratheon knows about it, okay? Stannis Baratheon left King's Landing because once Jon Arryn was poisoned, he was pretty sure that he would be next. So Stannis on Dragonstone is like, wait, Oris is dead? That means I'm number one in line, baby, because these are illegitimate children. So Stannis Baratheon makes it known that he should be king of the Seven Kingdoms. And you know who's really on board with helping him? The Starks. The Starks are going to be more than happy to topple the Lannisters. So they're actually going to hook up. Stannis Baratheon and the Starks are going to be all about taking over the Iron Throne. However, even though this is a new storyline, we're still going to have a lot of kings fighting over the Iron Throne. I think Renly Baratheon, no matter what, is going to assume that he should be the next king in line, jumping his brother at number two. I think Renly reaches out to the Tyrells, as he did in the television show, and I think the Baratheons that are led by Stannis and the Starks are going to aim for the Iron Throne. And of course, Littlefinger is going to ask Liza to pull back the Veil of Arryn, just like they kind of did on the canon TV show here. Again, that's important to Littlefinger's end. He needs an intact army of the Vale in order to eventually pull off what he wants to at the end, so they got to be out of it. But you're going to have all these other families fight each other. And he's basically going to hope that all of them are destabilized to the point no matter who ends up the Iron Throne, he can just kind of swoop in at the end. I think the Starks and Stannis Baratheon camp, they end up actually taking over the Iron Throne. I think they kill lots of people. Tywin Lannister is going to die. Obviously Joffrey as the sitting king has to die himself. Marcella and Tommen, I'm not sure. I like to think that they would actually be kept as like fosters or basically some kind of ward to make sure that the Lannisters keep their stuff together. Because Kevin Lannister is probably not going to be very happy about it while he's in Casterly Rock, and he's going to want some kind of revenge. But as long as he has some Lannister children, I think that they're going to actually uh, back off a little bit. Cersei and Jaime likely have to go as well. Jaime certainly is not going to be pardoned. He's a Kingslayer. So he probably ends up either having to escape or die. But either way, I wouldn't expect to see him or Cersei again moving forward in the story, whether it's by death or they end up just basically running away. However, the Iron Throne is very much in flux. The Stark's job is over once the Iron Throne is taken out and the Lannisters are no longer on top. So when they're marching home, I think that the Baratheons under Stannis is going to end up being taken down by the Tyrells and Renly's camp. Which I know is kind of wild that we're basically playing musical chairs with the Iron Throne, but I think that's what it has to be. When you have a war this big, even if you got the Iron Throne, until Renly and the Tyrells are dealt with, because the Tyrells want to be on top, 
it's not going to be dealt with. So I think actually the Baratheons are going to end up winning this war. And obviously Stannis has to die in order for that to go down. He's not going to just bend a knee to Renly. So unfortunately it's going to have to happen that way. Renly's going to end up as king. Marjorie end up as queen. And that's just how it has to be. Obviously that messes things up. Stannis Baratheon does not end up visiting the wall. Helping out Jon Snow and fighting off the wildlings. Which eventually could end up helping out the White Walkers. So that changes that storyline a good bit. Meaning that honestly Jon Snow could die based off of Mance Raider's wildling attack. That's very possible. And if that happens, of course, the White Walker fight is basically useless unless there's some kind of Azor High figure that is bestowed upon the Hound or Sir Davos or something. But all those characters may be dead too in this scenario. I, I, I don't know. With Renly and Marjorie on the Iron Throne, that creates a little bit of stabilization for the rest of Westeros. I mean, maybe the Greyjoys do have their own problems. Maybe they do loot Winterfell while the Starks are away. But ultimately, they are Krakens. They'll go back to the sea. In this kind of scenario, I'm not sure that Theon Greyjoy is going to go to the Greyjoys and have to do this whole reek thing with Ramsay Bolton. I'm not sure it goes that way. Ramsay still probably ends up being kind of a terrible person, but by Rob Stark's side up at Winterfell. I think Littlefinger spends a lot of time around Catelyn Stark. I think he does kill Liza Tully like he does on the television show, pushes her right out the moon door, ends up getting the Vale of Arryn. However, I think after that, he's going to be pushing real hard. He's going to be pressing real hard to get Catelyn Stark. And maybe he does eventually, but she's never been in love with the guy. So I'm not sure it's going to shake out that way. That part, I can't look into my crystal ball. However, I know Baelish is going to do whatever he can to get on the Iron Throne. I think before he can do that, the White Walker threat is going to come through and end up killing Littlefinger, killing almost everybody. I really think everyone is going to die in this scenario if that means a Jon Snow does not have Stannis intervene up at the wall. And I think Stannis is going to have to die in this scenario. So unfortunately, I don't think Littlefinger is going to get his game to play out. And I don't think that Renly and also Marjorie Tyrell are going to properly pay attention to the threat that's going to be beyond the wall. And obviously it could be dealt with if Daenerys Targaryen is a factor in this whole thing, but she's not a factor in this whole thing. If Barristan isn't released at the exact time that he was on the television show timeline, that means that he isn't there to save Daenerys Targaryen from the Manticore Venom. And Manticore Venom is pretty ridiculous. So Daenerys would die. I don't know what the hell happens to the dragons after that. They probably fly freely. They're certainly not going to be coming over to Westeros to help fight off the White Walkers, which means there's really no hope for Westeros. So I think ultimately all these characters, even though their paths may change, they're going to die. Tyrion dies, Lannisters die, Renly dies, Marjorie dies, uh, Oberyn Martell is not crushed by the mountain, the mountain may get to live in this whole thing. I, like, they may get to live for a period of time, but ultimately, I think White Walkers win if freaking Oris Baratheon is born first and stays alive. That's what I think. I think it ends in an icy grave, but what I've told you up to this point is kind of the story that I can put together based off of this info. Some of it is slight adjustments of the flapping of the butterfly's wings, but I think that's really what what if scenarios are all about. This is all about creativity, what you think would be moving forward in the story. This is one of the most requested what ifs that people have given me over the years, and I haven't known exactly how to tackle it. And this story, I think this is what would go down. I really do. If you feel differently about it, please let me know down below in the comment section. I would love to hear your thoughts on this because honestly, it's a complicated thing trying to judge what the personalities of some of these people would be for character that doesn't exist. Let me know and I would love to talk to you more about it. And if you want to see more what if videos on this channel, all you got to do is check out some of these right here. Obviously, we got some great stuff for you to check out. I have tons of them for you to enjoy. Also, hit the freaking subscribe button, dude. If you want to see more of these videos in the future, including some DC stuff, some Marvel, we got Loki videos coming on right now. Just make sure you hit that button so it can get delivered right to the front of the YouTube page. It's that easy. Otherwise, hope you have an amazing day, everybody. You take care. Goodbye.